Hi. In the previous two parts of this series, we've been looking at the Towers of Hanoi. And this is a puzzle where you take a stack of four objects. Here I have four coins. And these objects have to be of different sizes. And the goal of the puzzle is to move the stack of objects from this circle to this circle with a couple of rules. Rule number one being you can only move one object at a time. And rule number two being that you can never put a larger object on top of a smaller object. And what we were interested in was, what are the minimum number of moves it takes to solve the puzzle? And we ended up producing a table over here where n is the number of coins in the stack, and, or, and the uppercase m is the number of moves it takes to move that stack of coins, or the minimum number of moves. So if there was only one coin, it takes one move. If there are two coins, it takes three moves. If there's three coins, it takes seven moves, and et cetera, like this. And we ended up producing this particular formula for calculating the minimum number of moves to move any stack of n coins. And then in the last episode, we proved this formula. We proved that this formula will work all the time, regardless of how tall the stack was. But at the end of the video, I noted something else. I ignored the first row, and then I started taking note of the numbers in this table that were prime. So for instance, 2 and 3 are prime, 3 and 7 are prime, 4 is not prime, of course, it's 2 times 2, 15 is not prime, it's 3 times 5, 5 is prime, 31 is prime, 6 is not prime, it's 2 times 3. 63 is not prime, for instance, it could be 7 times 9. 7 is prime, and 127 is prime. And the pattern that immediately presents itself is, every single time, at least so far, that the n was prime, the number of coins was prime, the number of moves it took to move that stack of coins was also prime. And I presented the question, does this continue to happen for all values of n? I don't know. So let's explore that particular question. And there's actually kind of two sort of complementary questions at the same time here. One is that if n is prime, um, m, m is prime. But the other one is its inverse statement, which is that if n is composite, m is composite, because that seems to be happening at the same time too. Does every time the n turns out to be a composite number, that is a number, a, a positive integer that's not prime, more than one, uh, does the number of moves come out to be a composite number as well? So I want to start by exploring that inverse question, okay? If n is composite, Is MN composite? All right, let's explore that question. Well, if N is composite, then N can be written as A times B. We're both in the A, we're both the A and the B are greater than one and the A and B are both integers. I mean, that's what it means to be composite, right? That you're able to split it up into a multiplication statement where both of those two numbers are integers that are bigger than one. So that means instead of writing two to the n minus one, I could write this, m n is equal to two to the a b minus one. And then I can do something here. I can rearrange this a little bit. This is the same thing as two to the a to the b minus 1. Because remember, we have a power rule that says if I take a power and raise it to another exponent, I can multiply the two exponents together. Now I'm going to introduce another variable. Let some other variable, I'm going to use an x, equal the 2 to the a. All right. Now I can write this like this. mn is equal to x to the b minus 1. Now I'm hoping that you recall something from your senior high school math days. And if you haven't seen this yet, I'll explain it very briefly. It's something called the factor theorem. And the factor theorem works like this. If you can find a number that will make this go to zero, 
we call that number a zero or a root, then x minus that number has to be a factor. That's called the factor theorem. And if you're not familiar with it, you can Google it, you can look it up, and learn a little bit more about the factor theorem. But here there is an obvious zero. There's an obvious number that makes this expression go to zero, and that is one. If I substitute in one for the x, one to the b, remember b is some integer greater than one, so one to any of those kind of numbers would still be one, and one minus one, of course, is zero. So x equals one is a zero, therefore, x minus 1 is a factor, according to the factor theorem. Well, wait a second. If x minus 1 is a factor, and x was 2 to the a, well then, 2 to the a minus 1 is a factor. Let's look at this expression a little more closely. a is a number, an integer, greater than 1. So the smallest a could be is 2. And 2 to the 2 is 4 minus 1 is 3, which is also bigger than 1. So in other words, I've just found something that divides into mn. Should write in here, is a factor of mn. In other words, mn is composite. Not only do I know that mn is composite, I actually even have a little formula for calculating a potential factor for mn. Let's take a look at the composite numbers we have so far. So for instance, 4 can be written as 2 times 2, so I could have the a be a 2. <clears throat> Remember, the a could be any factor of the number that's more than 1. And 2 to the 2 minus 1 is 3, and 3 does divide into 15, so 3 is a factor of 15. Uh, 6 is 2 times 3, let's make the a the 3. Okay, 2 to the 3, again, I'm just using this formula here, 2 to the 3 is 8 minus 1 is 7, and 7 is a factor of 73. It is working. Well, I shouldn't be surprised it's working. I just proved it. Okay, so this statement, can take the question mark off. If n is composite, take the is out, then m is composite. I have that thing proved. All right. Well, that's not quite the statement I wanted to prove, though, when I started this particular video. I wanted to prove the statement, if n is prime, then mn is prime. Does that statement immediately follow from this one? I want you to think about that for a second. If n is composite, then mn is composite. Does that mean its inverse statement is also true, that if n is prime, mn is prime? Does, the, does a statement imply that its inverse has to be true? The answer to that question is no. It's not necessarily true. Okay. It doesn't necessarily connect. It is possible still. All this is saying is that if this number is a composite number, guaranteed the number of moves will be a composite number. But that's saying nothing about if it's prime, is it guaranteed that the output would be prime? Well, let's go through a few of these numbers. Let's, let's, let's extend this table a little bit. So for instance, we have the next few numbers are all composite numbers, 8, 9, 10. Those are all composite numbers. And uh, if I go and we're going to say, see, 2 to the 8 minus, that's 255. Well, that's clearly a composite number because 5 divides into that. 2 to the 9 minus 1 is 511. Ooh. That's kind of primey. But according to this, it has to be a composite number. And not only that, um, it, uh, I can calculate what must be a factor. Uh, 9 is 3 times 3. And so 2 to the 3 is 8 minus 1 is 7. 7 has to divide into that. And I'll leave it for you to verify it, but it does. 7 is a factor, so that is composite. Um, 2 to the 10 minus 1 is 100 and 1,023. Um, and that is also a composite number. We're not surprised by that. One I'm interested in is the next one, 11. 11 is a prime number. Is 2 to the 11 minus 1 a prime number? So for instance, that comes out to be 2047. Is that prime? Kind of looks prime. Turns out it's not prime. You can do a little bit of uh, digging around, get out a calculator, play around for a little bit. You shouldn't take too long to find out it's actually 23 times 89. So there we go. We're busted. Burp. 
Turns out the statement that if n is prime, then mn also has to be prime is false. I've just proven that. It's interesting how to prove something works all the time for all values of n, that can be a tough problem to solve. But to prove that something doesn't work requires only the discovery of what we call a counterexample. If you can find one counterexample, well then you know the statement is false. And here we found ourselves a counterexample. So it turns out that when n is prime, there's no guarantee that mn will be prime. That still leaves another question. For what values of n do we get prime numbers? Well, right off the bat, I know if n is composite, there's no way that the result will be composite, or will be prime. So I'm kind of interested in what, what, what questions um, come out to be prime numbers. So for instance, uh, 13. That's our next prime number. And 2 to the 13 minus 1 is 8,191. That turns out to be prime. And I'll leave it for you to verify. It really doesn't take too long to verify it. All you have to do is start going through the numbers that could potentially divide into this. Now, you don't have to go through every number all the way up to 8,091. All you have to do is go up to every, go through every prime number up to the square root of 8,191. So you're doing two, does two divide into it, does three divide into it, don't check four, because two didn't divide into it, so there's no point checking four. Then check five, six, seven, uh, check 11, all through all the prime numbers up to the square root of 8,191. It really won't take too long with the calculator, and you will verify that that is indeed prime. Uh, 14, no point checking that, that's composite, 15 is composite, 16 is composite, 17 would be my next one, 17, 2 to the 17 minus 1 is 131,071, by no stretch of the imagination, imagine that I'm doing these in my head, there we go. And that number as well turns out to be prime. A little bit more work to do it, but uh, you know, shouldn't take too long. And in fact, I've got one more, 19 also works. Uh, 2 to the 19 minus 1 is, what do we got? 524,287, and both of those numbers turn out to be prime. So there we go. 11 seems to be the exception so far. All the rest of our prime numbers up to 19 are producing prime numbers for the number of moves it would take to move that stack of coins. All of these numbers were known for quite some time, okay? because they're not too hard to work with. Even if you did it by hand, it is doable. It'll take you a while, but it is doable to do it. But then things started to dry up. Okay? It started to seem like uh, they hit a wall here at this point. right? And then a guy by the name of Marin Marsan in the 17th century made a fairly bold claim. Let's see, where I can sneak these in here. Box this off. He, he made the claim that these numbers were prime. M31, M67, M127, and M257. He discovered his own pattern and said that by his pattern, these guys are, are prime. And since that time, these numbers have been referred to as Morsian primes. But the question is, are these numbers really prime? He claimed that they were prime, but there was no real mathematically solid proof. He just discovered his own little pattern. And so it became a bit of a puzzle. Are these, in fact, prime numbers? Well, it took a little while for some people to start to determine whether they were or whether they not. It turns out that M31 is indeed prime. Let me write this out. This one's a little long. 2, 1, 4, 7, 4, 8, 3, 6, 4, 7. That turns out to be a prime number, so I'm going to box that in. And that number was discovered to be prime by Leonard Euler. <laughs> in 1772, he proved that that particular number was prime. And in fact, he also showed that there are no other ones in here. This is, this is, the next one after 19 is 31. There is quite a gap, which in itself is kind of interesting. All those prime numbers that are in there, 
uh, none of those turn out to be prime. But M31 does turn out to be the next prime, and Euler showed that. Okay. Um, this one turns out not to be prime, M67. So Marcin was wrong on that one. This one, and this is the last one where I'll write out all the numbers, this one turns out to be 9370772 times 7618382. Seven, two, eight, seven. And if you can imagine, it, you know, figuring that out by hand, wow, that is an impressive feat. So that one turns out not to be prime. So it seems like, yeah, now that throws doubt on these other two, doesn't it? Okay. Then a guy by the name of Edward Lucas, in 1876, came up with what I thought, what I think is a pretty interesting theorem. He came up with this statement. It's actually a, a sequence. A recursively defined sequence, I'll write the sequence out, and L0 is equal to 4. Yeah. Okay? So this is a recursively defined sequence. L0, I'll explain why we got we start at 0 on this one. But L0 or L0 is 4. And then to figure out L1, you put 0 in for the end, so that means you take L L0 square it and subtract 2. So L1 is going to be 4 squared, which is 16 minus 2, which is 14. And L2 would be 14 squared minus 2, which is 194. And this keeps going on like that. Okay. And what Lucas, this is L-U-C-A-S, this is 1876. What Lucas showed was, if you want to show that, say, for instance, M13, whether it was prime or not, what you need to work out was L13, and then show that M13 divides into L13. And he produced a theorem that was proven that if that turns out to be the case, if M13 divides into L13, then M13 has to be prime. I'm not going to, by any stretch, get into the logic or the reasoning behind that, but that turns out to be a true statement. And armed with that, that dramatically reduces the amount of time it takes to uh, start to prove that these things are or are not prime. And armed with that, he showed that this guy, M127, was indeed a prime number. And in fact, he also showed that M 257 was not. So that turns out to be a prime number. Okay. He then, of course, didn't stop there. He went in and started discovering other prime numbers. And Lucas also showed beyond M127 that M61 is prime. M89 is prime. So these are some of the ones that were missed in here. And uh, M107 was also prime. So he came up with three more previously non-suspected Marcian primes right there. Okay. This guy was worked out in 1914 and it is the last Marcian prime number discovered by hand. And these numbers are getting pretty ridiculous. Like for instance, this particular number, M127, turns out to be 39 digits long. Clearly I'm not going to write it. It'd be a little silly. So doing this work by hand is laborious, to say the least. Okay. But as we got into the mid part of the 20th century, of course, computers are starting to come in line. And these kind of mathematical checks that computers do, and by the way, the methods that computers use to determine whether a Marcian prime is prime or not, is exactly this process here. And uh, computers are very, very good at this and very, very fast at this. It's the kind of thing they sort of excel at. So, of course, it doesn't take long for you start to give these tasks to computers. And once computers got involved, more and more Marcian primes began to be discovered. And this was in the realm of what you would call your supercomputers, right? These top-end computers developed by large corporations. Um, and they would give these computers a task like this to see just, just how, how, how impressive they actually were. But in 1996, a guy in Orlando uh, determined 
But you know what? Rather than giving the job to supercomputers, we got this thing now called the internet, and we can network computers together through the internet, and then each of those computers could donate a part of their processing time to starting to crank out Marcian primes. And he started what's called GIMPs, which stands for the Great Internet Marcian Prime Search. And this is a public website. You can just Google it and find it. And you can join this network if you want to. So you could be involved with finding out more of these Marcian Primes. And in fact, the most recent Marcian Prime was, uh, where can I f write it here? I'm running, running really tight on room. I'm gonna write it sort of on an angle over here. Uh, was, I gotta get this right, M5788. Uh, 5161. Keep in mind, this isn't the number. That's not the actual number. That's the N that goes into this particular formula to calculate the number. This number is ridiculous. And this turned out to be the 48th uh, Mercian Prime discovered in 2013, only a couple of years ago. Okay. And discovered on somebody's home PC. Anyway. I think this is going to close off this particular series. I hope that you enjoyed it.